I wanted to talk about uh, causality. And I thought about various suttas that would uh, approach this theme and tried at all costs to get out of talking about Paticca Samapada, which is a huge topic, but then in the end realized I would have to talk about Paticca Samapada, or at least the Buddha would, to really explain causality, because this is the heart of the Dhamma. He actually said, the Buddha himself said, that one who sees dependent origination, the translation of Paticca Samapada, sees the Dhamma. One who sees the Dhamma sees Paticca Samuppada, sees dependent origination. So somebody who breaks through to stream entry sees this clearly. They see these causal sequences very, very clearly and can explain them equally well. So um, I'm not going to attempt to explain it so much as to uh, lay out how the Buddha taught it and see if we can have some discussion about how we might... Um, allow these teachings to inform our practice in ways that helps us gain some insight into it because obviously what's laid out here is it's the kind of bare bones you know it's a, a causal sequence it doesn't go into great depth but when I first heard this teaching on a, a Vipassana retreat with S. Gorenko in 1996 I'm showing my age um, it just answered my whys <laughs> why as in w-h why <laughs> and yesterday at the end of Ajahn's retreat I was talking about the importance of having a why you know a question about what life means where did all this come from where is it going to end is there an end and really this is the best answer to that question you could ever find it's explaining the whole sequence of birth going through to old age sickness and death and then rebirth again um, and also the opposite. So it goes in two directions. The first direction is called anuloma, which uh, is interesting because I studied Indian medicine and in Indian medicine, we say that um, we actually use the same terminology to say, for example, that a kind of wind element in the body is going downwards. We say vat anuloma. Vata is like air or wind. We say vat anuloma. And when it comes the opposite way, which it shouldn't do, it's uh, vata patiloma. And uh, it's the same here. Anuloma is like, in a sense, you could say the downward spiral or the spiraling around samsara, you know, carrying on through um, suffering, basically, through this realm of suffering. And the patiloma is when that whole sequence gets reversed and starts to unravel and subsequently allows us to gain release from samsara, release from this uh, cycle of birth and death and thereby release from suffering. So in a sense, it shows us how suffering is built and also how it can be um, removed, how it can be disassembled or defabricated, if you like, and lead us towards Nibbana. And there are 12 factors, <laughs> just stating the obvious at first before we get into it. There are 12 factors. So now if somebody says to you, what is dependent origination? How many factors are there? You can at least say there are 12. <laughs> and I also went into the little uh, description at the beginning of the chapter and found to my delight that Bhikkhu Bodhi had referenced um, a summary of the basic principle of, of Paticca Samapada. He calls it an abstract structural principle of conditionality, which is probably quite technical language. But I love this and I want this on my, I don't know if I want a gravestone, but I want it where my ashes lie, <laughs> wherever that is. Or if you throw them into the Ganga, I'm very happy. Um, and that is, when this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. This, that can be whatever you want to put there. When this does not exist, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. Isn't that just so beautifully logical? There's something about that that just sits in my heart in such a deep way and gives me a lot of faith in this whole practice, this whole path. And reading that reminded me of um, 
how the Venerable Sariputta, one of the Buddha's, well, the Buddha's right-hand disciple in the monk Sangha, that he had right-hand and left-hand, supposedly, disciples uh, in the female Sangha as well. But of the monks, uh, the Venerable Sariputta was considered to be equal in wisdom to the Buddha himself. But he wasn't the first uh, disciple under the Buddha to become enlightened. The first disciple was the Venerable Asaji. And the way that the Sariputta, the Venerable Sariputta met the Dhamma was by meeting Venerable Asaji as he was on arms round. And he saw him coming along the road and was really struck by his peaceful countenance and serene glowing features. And he approached him and said, please, you know, what is your doctrine? Who is your teacher? Please tell me. And at first, uh, the Venerable Asaji didn't really want to say very much because I guess he was newly enlightened. I don't quite know why. Um, I think he actually asked the Venerable Sariputta, you know, to go to the Buddha himself. But Sariputta said, I can't wait for that. I need to know. Just tell me in a nutshell, what is your teaching? What is the teaching of, of the Buddha, of the Tathagata, of your teacher? So then he said something along the lines of, of those things that have a cause, the Tathagata, the Buddha, the fully awakened one knows the cause. And he also knows the way to eradicate that cause. And this was enough for Venerable Sariputta to, it was stream winning, wasn't it? He gained stream winning at that time. So he broke through to the Dhamma, the eye of the Dhamma arose by that very, very simple teaching, realizing that everything is conditioned, everything that arises. When it says of those things that have a cause, you can also translate it as of those things that arise or have arisen. In other words, everything that we encounter, that we see, that we hear, smell, taste, touch, and even can imagine every phenomena that is that has arisen or is arising has a cause. There's nothing without a cause. Even my mom used to say when I was little, my mom always says there's a reason for everything. And I mean, it sounded a little bit kind of hocus pocus, you know, there's a reason, like some sort of philosophical reason, but actually she was right. She just didn't get it down to that simplicity and also that detail that we find in the Patricia Samapada. So, um, yeah, before we begin, I'm wondering if I will come to uh, the questions in the box uh, and just see if we can clarify something around that. I haven't actually read it yet, but I understand it relates to last week. So uh, was it last week that we talked about um, the sense bases probably and previously, or maybe the khandhas? So we've talked about feeling, we've talked about the sense bases, and we've talked about the khandhas. These are all basically the components of what we take to be a self. And uh, so, yeah, the khandhas are like the components of existence or those aspects of ourselves that, well, they're not aspects of ourselves. They're, I mean, sometimes they're called aggregates. I prefer components. And there's nothing beyond those aggregates or components that we can take to be a self either. There's no self in them or outside them. Um, so they are basically, in brief, uh, mater the material element, the element of feeling, uh, perception, volitional formations or will, and consciousness. That's five, isn't it? Is that five? Perception, yeah, and consciousness. So the question here, do you want to go for it? I haven't actually read it yet. So this is Venerable Lupeka, for those who don't know. And I'm delegating. <laughs> How does delight differ from pleasant feelings in the second kanda, is delight, I have to know the party word, what you mean by delight, it must be piti or is delight more subtle than pleasant feeling so that we can even delight in and cling on to our own suffering? Mm -hmm. Which kanda does delight belong to? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by delight, but maybe it, it's a... a, a all oh, right uh, what you mean by delight 
if you had a poly word for it, it would be very easy. Well, <laughs> but, I don't think it matters if there's a poly word or not, actually, because anything that's pleasant or unpleasant is feeling. It's in the realm of feeling. It's still, it's, and none of these candors are separate. So as long as there's feeling, there'll also be a perception of that feeling, right? So when delight arises, I mean, it might be that you're speaking more of mental delight. So there is an aspect, of course, of, of vinyana in every feeling and also perception because you have to actually perceive that it's delightful. So none of these candles arise independently of each other. And I think the main differentiation here would be whether something is wholesome or unwholesome. So all pleasant feeling, whether it's bodily or mental, will be either amisa or niramisa, which means kind of of the senses or kind of away from the senses or leading away from the senses. So for example, um, you know, the pleasure of chocolate is very much the pleasure of the senses, right? I mean, of course you feel it in your body, you feel it in your mind, but it's stimulated by the senses. Whereas the pleasure of meditation is actually coming from the purity of the mind, it's different, but it's still not entirely removed from the body in the early stages. Later on, as it refines more and more and the mind becomes more empowered, then the mental pleasure becomes stronger than the physical pleasure. And it's almost as though that, that sense takes over and uh, it becomes so strong. You know, for example, if you get a light shining up in meditation, a so-called light, it's just a reflection of your mind. Um, it's a sign that the mind is becoming very empowered and the energy is going to the mind. And it can be so strong that it, in a way, swamps the physical senses. So it really depends what it's delight in, you know. I think that would differentiate it as, um, you know, being worthy of following or not. Um, and, yeah, I mean, pleasant feeling includes a whole range of subtle and grosser feelings. So it's really an area to explore. And I think, you know, the confusion that we had when reading it was just exactly what you mean by delight. It's very subjective, isn't it? You know, what you find is delightful, someone else might find is agitating <clears throat> or vice versa. And I think the more you get used to the pleasant feelings, the more any feeling, even strong bliss, becomes actually quite agitating and we incline towards the subtle more. So it's usually a good thing to incline towards the subtle in meditation. So if it is subtler than the pleasant feeling you normally experience, then I'd say it's probably good to... Uh, incline that way because there's more peace there there's more um um even stability there to some extent yeah does that somehow help and we can even delight in and cling on to our own suffering i mean definitely <laughs> we're doing that all the time i mean you know we're, we're doing that even when we get when we cling on to our meditation I know Ajahn Brahm often says the states of jhanas are sort of, we shouldn't be worried about getting attached to them. And that's true in the beginning of the practice, certainly, and probably for quite a long way in. But eventually, you know, if you are kind of um, stuck on that kind of delight, then it, it won't easily cease. And the whole point is that, you know, as long as you're in the realm of feeling anything, you're still in the realm of suffering. It's just subtler and subtler degrees, you know. So what you think of as happiness when you're young starts to not feel like so much happiness when you when you get older or when you get a bit more wisdom and it's the same with all these mental states so if somebody has you know experienced first jhana a lot at first they think it's the best thing you could ever experience then later when they get into the second jhana they will maybe look back on that first jhana and think gosh that was actually very coarse you know and and the same thing as you go subsequently deeper so, uh, yeah, we are delighting, clinging on to our suffering all the time, which is why we don't want to let it go. But at least if we can move on to subtler happiness, you know, and start to uh, wean ourselves off the coarser unhappiness and the coarser happiness, then we're moving in the right direction. Mm. Yeah, I said it's feeling, isn't it? It's feeling, perception, and vinyana. But delight, I mean, it's basically, yeah, it's feeling. It's Vedana, I would say, yeah. 
All right, let's get into today's sutta on Paticca Samuppada. And uh, this is the second sutta in the Nidana Samyutta, chapter 12 in this really big, fantastic book called the Samyutta Nikaya. So um, I'm just going to plunge straight into the, the whole analysis of it so that as we go through each link, we also have a bit of a description of what it means. OK, but you can stop me at any time and we can have questions, comments, complaints. <laughs> Ajahn Brown calls that the three C's, even though complaints, no question is really a cue. <laughs> but anyway, it sounds like cut. So it's the three C's. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I'm not sure how deeply or successfully we can really explain this because we haven't really prepared. This is more of a discussion and um, it's interesting to, to see what this brings up for us in a practical way. So this is called Analysis of Dependent Origination. And it takes place at Savati, which is a place that the Buddha lived for a very long time, about 12 reigns, 12 vassals. So I'm going to translate bhikkhus as monastics in this case. There may well have been lay people there as well. There will most certainly be bhikkhunis, I say. <laughs> Monastics, I will teach you dependent origination. Oh, page 534. I will teach you dependent origination and I will analyze it for you. Listen to that and attend closely. I will speak. So this is the Buddha speaking. So are you listening? Yes, venerable sir, those monastics replied. And the blessed one said this. And I'm going to fill in the dots here because it's uh, abbreviated the next paragraph. And what monastics is dependent origination? And I also might give my preferred translation for these terms. So here it says, with ignorance as a condition, volitional formations come to be. So I would much prefer the word delusion as a condition. Volitional formations come to be. Because delusion means we're seeing something, but we're actually mistaking what we're seeing to be something that it's not. Whereas ignorance seems more like um, a lack of knowledge in some way. And that's not really the thing. It's more that we're actually misinterpreting something. We're actually seeing it, you know, as permanent, as impermanent, Oh, no, sorry, as permanent when it's not, when it's actually impermanent. We're seeing things as um, happiness when they're actually suffering. And we're seeing things as um, eternal or having some kind of essence, some kind of self when they're actually not self. So with delusion as condition, volitional formations come to be. With volitional formations, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as condition, name and form, or if you like, mind and mental contents, which is Ajahn Brahm's preferred rendering. Sometimes people say mind and matter, but it's really anything that the mind can be aware of. So mind and mental contents. With mind and mental contents, or name as form, name and form as condition, the six sense bases. With the six sense bases as condition, contact. With contact as condition, feeling. With feeling as condition, craving. With craving as condition, clinging. With clinging as condition, existence. With existence as condition, birth. With birth as condition, Aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, sometimes translated as grief, and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. This monastics is called dependent origination. <clears throat> there you go. You've got the answer to why. You've got the answer to life. And are you enlightened yet? <laughs> <laughs> maybe getting closer so now we're going to go through it as this sort of does so we're going to take um hmm, so he starts here with aging and death this is interesting isn't it 
maybe this is one of the things we can most tangibly observe because we're already born. So if we go back to before we were born, it's very difficult to understand what was happening, but this is happening right now. And what monastics is aging and death? So the significance here, as I understand it, is that many people who um, discuss the Patitya Samapada, great monastics as well, some people have an interpretation of this being a kind of mind moment and that all of these links can happen in a single moment to some degree. But when we actually look at the way the Buddha taught it, it's clearly spanning three lifetimes, the previous life, the present life and the future life. And this makes that very clear because he's not talking about um, birth and death as kind of um, psychological births and deaths, you know, of each my moment and every moment where we die, so to speak, and a new moment is born, but we're talking about actual um, aging and death and birth <clears throat> into bodies. So here we go. And what monastics is aging and death? The aging of various beings in the various orders of beings. They're growing old, brokenness of teeth, grayness of hair, wrinkling of skin, decline of vitality. So it's going to say decline of visual something or other because I can hardly see that word. <laughs> Degeneration of the faculties. This is called aging. The passing away of the various beings from the various orders of beings, their perishing, break up, disappearance, mortality, death, completion of time, the break up of the aggregates or components of existence, the laying down of the carcass, this is called death. Thus, this aging and this death are together called aging and death. Mm. I really like this definition. It's actually quite amusing, isn't it? The growing old brokenness of teeth. <laughs> Has anyone got broken teeth? Bits kind of fall out when you chew, yes. <laughs> I went to a dentist in Perth a few years ago and I wanted her to remove these tea stains from my teeth and she really went for it. And she actually chipped my teeth in a couple of places. <laughs> my teeth are really strong too, but yeah, she managed to do that. So they're not that strong. <laughs> so brokenness of teeth, grayness of hair. Sometimes people think I've only shaved one side of my head because this part's gray. So they think I've just shaved that a bit. <laughs> The rest of it's still black. But it's interesting when you shave your head, you know, over the years, because you sort of start to see in the shavings, shavelings, shavings, um, kind of this scattered salt and pepper look. And you think, ah, but it's still mostly black, you know, it's just a little bit of grey. Even though you think there's a lot when it's on your head, but you see it on the floor and it's like there's not that much. And then over time it kind of changes. So it's like then sort of mixed. And now mine's tipped to being mostly grey. <laughs> So you can't really lie about it. Uh, but the good news is that you don't need to dye your hair when you're a monastic because you can just shave it off. So any of you who are up for shaving it off, you can save a lot of money on hair dye. Not to mention shampoo. <laughs> Grayness of hair, wrinkling of skin that we think we can defy with beauty products. You know, They really suck us in, don't they? To spending an awful lot of money on them but I've never seen anyone without wrinkling of skin. And if you do, it's usually that they've had Botox and their faces don't actually make the right expressions that accord with their emotions. So they start to look like kind of, mm, like the skin's been pulled tight across their forehead and it starts to look almost plasticky, doesn't it? It looks really quite odd. Wrinkling of skin is inevitable. Decline in vitality. Hmm. Degeneration of the faculties. This is called aging. And I'm certainly seeing that in front of me because it's increasingly hard to read without my glasses. And I keep forgetting my glasses because I'm in denial. <laughs> so 
<laughs> I still think of myself as someone who doesn't wear glasses and that's why I don't remember them. It's also part of the generation, isn't it? Not remembering. <laughs> <laughs> Have you noticed any of these? <laughs> the generation of the faculty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the passing away of various beings from the various orders of beings. So the orders of beings means not only human beings, but even beings in the other realms, like even the ghost realms, perhaps, even the Deva realms, even though they live very, very long lives, like they live for eons. And I don't know, in some texts it says kind of, I don't know, does it say millions or like 200,000 years or more than that, right? Do you remember some of the life cycles of the Devas are like really, really long? Anyway, and they think they're eternal because of that. You know, there's beings in those realms that feel that they're gods and they're creators because they see all these other beings taking birth and dying, but they're the ones watching and they don't seem to die. And then finally, their faculties also start to fade, their vitality, their joy, they start to become kind of weak and then they fall from those realms. And this is apparently a great suffering for those beings it's like you've been in the most blissful state i mean maybe it's not jhana states but it's still a very high and happy state for so long with almost no suffering and then suddenly and you thought you were eternal you thought you were out of samsara and then suddenly your faculties your body if you have a subtle body starts to die so this is really big suffering and you can go from those realms straight down to lower realms you don't necessarily get reborn in those realms again or even in the human realm because for all that time you've been kind of enjoying yourself you haven't necessarily been making more good karma it's more that it's an effect of the good things you've done previously but the effects wear out you know and that's one of the reasons why the human realm is a great place to practice because we can actually um we have something like a mix i don't know if you can really say it's even between happiness and suffering but there's enough of both usually usually that there's something that you want to live for you want to exist for and you have enough conditions not always some people don't but usually enough conditions to do some good and yet there's enough suffering to give you a sense of urgency a sense of you know well sometimes outright despair and existential crisis to make efforts Mm, to make efforts to walk on the path or at least to end this whole realm this whole round so the real key difference there is whether or not we hear the dhamma unless we hear the dhamma we might not know what to do so we've just discussed death aging aging and death and before I get on to birth, I'm going to come to the chat because there's a couple of comments there. And um, please feel free to ask outright also by raising your hands so that it's not like a lecture, but I can also discuss things with you and so can Ben Rebecca. <laughs> Why does ignorance arise? Yes. <laughs> and that's the kind of question that the Buddha actually didn't really answer. But in this sutta, it does sort of say... Um, what ignorance is it's basically saying that it's not understanding the four noble truths so that's probably the reason in a sense but the buddha didn't say that it has a first cause he said you can't really trace that you know it just goes so far back it's like impossible to find a first cause but he did say it has nutrients it has food it has sustenance and that sustenance is the five hindrances so every time the five hindrances arise in the mind craving greed um, anger especially um, we're just not seeing things as they are and we can see that by the way it kind of colors our perspective on life you know when you have anger in your mind you just can't see the good in a person or you can't see the good in anything right, that you're angry at um, so you're kind of blinded and that's really what delusion means it means you're blinded to the truth um, you're not seeing things as they are so we can at least start suspending the five hindrances or um, weakening them in our meditation. And that's why when the five hindrances are overcome, we can experience deeper states of meditation where the mind gets energized. And then we have an opportunity when those hindrances are absent to see things clearly, to see things as they are. So that's the whole purpose of meditation. It's to 
you know, decrease and even eradicate the five hindrances temporarily so that ignorance is starved, illusion is starved for a while. And then we can actually see things much more clearly without sort of vested interest in what we see. Yeah, but I guess this is a question that can only really be answered by practice because that is, in a sense, the question. But I, I do think the more important question is, well, it's arisen. <laughs> Our whole lives are kind of running through that because of that. We were born because of that. So how do we find a way out? How do we find a way beyond it? You know, how do we actually um, weaken delusion? And the opposite of delusion, which is called avidya in Pali, is wisdom, which is vidya. So you could also translate delusion as a lack of wisdom. Avidya as opposed to vidya. Uh, I'll just go through the other questions in the box then come to you, Susan. I call it silver hair. It reframes it and sounds nicer. Yes, it sounds nicer, but it's still great. <laughs> You're still aging. But yes, it sounds very nice. We don't have to, like, you know, despise it. I don't think the Buddha's saying, you know, this is something we have to despise. It's just a reality check. It's like we will age, you know. The same when he talks about the body being kind of, you know, blood, pus, urine, etc. He doesn't say that's disgusting, that's terrible. He just says this is what the body is. It's full of pus, blood, spittle, snot. Um, what else? Hair, hair of the head, hair of the body, which is not very beautiful when you take it off. It looks <laughs> nice when it's there all shiny, brushed nicely, but as soon as you take it off, it looks horrible. If you get some in your food, it's disgusting. You don't want to eat the food. So, so yeah, we can reframe it to sound nicer, but we're still going to age, you know. Do devas come back to the human realm? Yeah, sure they can. But the point is they don't really know where they're going to go. It's likely they'll come back to the human realm. They've certainly not got liberated yet. I think it's possible if there are stream winners around that you might get liberated from those realms, but it's harder according to what the common consensus in Buddhist circles. Yeah. I'm going to come to Suzanne and then another question in the, in the chat. You want to answer this? Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, my question about the ignorance, uh, why it arises, you know, it's the first thing, you know, on, in the, the first thing. And <laughs> meditation, I think it was yesterday, I had an experience which kind of gave rise to the question afterwards, not in the experience. I was fine then. So the experience was, uh, you know, the last meditation of the of the retreat. I was uh, kind of falling um, and into whatever. I don't know. I, I called it nothingness, but it's not even true. It was, there was something, but I don't know how to call it. And then when I was at the bottom, I met uh, like, a part of me that that kind of keeps things together so so things don't fall apart you know like a sense of i or the mind and i was talking to it you know saying okay thank you you've been there but it's okay you can go now and it actually did it left and it was such a amazing experience and the feeling was why did i ever think that th that i could die it's i, I can't it's not <laughs> It was just an illusion, you know, and then I was really happy and blissed out and everything. And now one day later, mm. I don't have the feeling anymore. It's gone. So I had a little glimpse. And then at the at the moment, at the question of why it was their ignorance in the first place, I didn't have the question because it didn't matter anymore. Mm. But now that I don't have the experience anymore, mm. like I do in the world, did this ever happen that I I I I I, sep I, I cling to something? thinking I have to because otherwise I die you know it's mm. and it's interesting you say the Buddha never answered the question mm -hmm. um I don't know yeah yeah <laughs> yeah I know I just always think that this ignorance is just so deep we sort of touch parts of it in in our meditation and recognize like you did you know at the bottom of the pit this yes. someone holding it together but uh it's um why it, 
I, you know, it's so deeply ingrained. It's hard to eradicate. And so, what? yeah, you just keep meeting it over and over again and keep um, <laughs> picking at it with a teaspoon. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, why is it there? It's just, it's just our root. Because <laughs> it's just so, so much nicer without it. Huh? It's really so much nicer without it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Without it, but... yeah. yeah it's carrying, carrying us around forever. So there's some like in like some philosophies, I think they say, It's because we want to, it's a, we, we choose to experience this kind of some, you know, consciousness, whatever it chooses to say, oh, I, I want to do this now. And I'm, I don't know if mm -hmm. that's true. I don't really don't. Yeah. But yeah, we could, I could live with it. There's no answer. <laughs> right. But I mean, I do think this gives the answer to me. This kind of gives the best answer that what is it just by defining it as not knowing suffering, not knowing the origin of suffering, not knowing the cessation of suffering and not knowing the way leading to cessation is ignorance, is delusion. So it's because we don't know those things that there is delusion. Like if we would know those things, then delusion to that extent would be eradicated. That's what stream winning is. A vidya turns into vidya, vidya yeah. of the four noble truths. So we haven't seen that yet. You know, even in deep meditation, you may feel that delusion's been um, weakened, but it hasn't been abandoned because then we take those deep states as something real. But they're also still conditioned. They're also still in the realm of, of delusion. Actually, mm -hmm. it's just that. You know, there's less of it than usual. It's a little, it's a thinner veil than usual. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. makes sense, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, these are really, these questions are sort of on the same track. <clears throat> uh, Venables, how is it? That, can we call it delusion? Because I think the word ignorance is actually quite misleading. It actually means the opposite of wisdom. So let's try and call it delusion because it's, remember, it's, it's not not knowing. It's actually knowing, like seeing something that isn't there or being deluded, being mis, uh, how do you say, like misinterpreting what is there. So it's not something we can work out with our, intellect it's not something that knowledge can supplant it's something that we actually have to see that we're not seeing yeah how is it that delusion can have an end without a cause <laughs> is it not a conditioned phenomena or is it that the cause of ignorance itself is craving like they support each other ah oh, these are really deep questions i mean i don't think that it hasn't got a cause i think the buddha basically said there's no discernible beginning it's slightly different from saying there's no cause. But what we do know is there's sustenance, there's food for delusion, which is the five hindrances. So yes, in a sense, they arise simultaneously and they support each other. I mean, when craving is reduced, then that is one of the foods for, for delusion. So the delusion will um, become weaker for a while. I haven't really got more to say on that. But yeah, I do think they support each other definitely. Because when we crave, we're again kind of clouding our mind, you know, we're seeing something that's not really there. Like we're we're looking at say a person that we find attractive and only seeing the bits that actually rouse that lust or that craving. We're not seeing the other parts of that person, like the irritating habits or the bad breath in the morning or, you know, the whatever they do in the toilet. We're not looking at that, right? We're looking at the bits that kind of rouse craving in us and we're sort of feeding it because of delusion, because we want to believe that there's something there to crave for. And we're actually addicted to craving. There's a lovely phrase in the suttas. It says something like blinded by delusion, fettered by craving. And Ajahn Brahms retranslated that as, um, um, yeah, I think he retranslated it as blinded by delusion, addicted to wanting. 
which I think is brilliant because we're actually addicted to wanting. We want to want. Even if there's nothing much to want for, we find something to want because we like that feeling of, <gasps> it's going somewhere, we're getting somewhere, you know, there's something I'm moving towards. So yeah, they do support each other, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Ajahn Brahmali links delusion with wrong view, yeah, and suggests to start with right view, of course. But I mean, the right view that we start with in the beginning is, is preliminary because we haven't seen the noble truth. So until we're a stream winner, we haven't really got right view. So there are two sort of levels of right view in the suttas. And the first one is just enough to get you going on the path. So that's defined something like, um, uh, how does it actually start? Something like there is mother, there is father. It doesn't start like that, though. There is There are um, recluses and Brahmins worthy of respect. In other words, you didn't come here alone. There's something to be grateful for. Um, it is possible to be liberated. There are people that have been. Uh, just a sec, Richard, um, I'll come to you, I've seen your hand. Um, and some basic insight into the Four Noble Truths again. So at least a preliminary understanding that there's suffering, that suffering arises from a cause and, and some idea about how to um, pacify or let's say weaken that cause, which means weaken craving. So yeah, again, weakening craving weakens wrong view, right? And starts to um, set you on track with right view. So but delusion that prevents you from seeing the Four Noble Truths is only overcome when you see them, and that is stream winning. So we have to start where we're at and sort of work through the Eightfold Path and keep returning to different, I mean, hopefully the whole thing sort of starts to come together and our practice is informed by our view. And as the practice deepens, the meditation deepens, we start to see things more clearly, the clearer our view, the deeper our view, you know, the more aligned our view is with the way things are. So we do start to see impermanence quite easily, you know, as an experience, as an experiential knowledge. And we start to have some insight into non-self, at least some of the time, you know, when we have maybe a deeper meditation than usual, you know, and it feels like the self is almost absent, if not, yeah, it's not quite absent, actually, but it can feel that way compared to the usual solidified sense of self. So we start to, you know, undermine it that way. So yeah, that's that's very true. You want to go for this? Is this wanting to want part of Bhavatanda? Yeah, isn't it? Wanting to want. Yes. Do you want to Does, translate Bhavatanha for people? Oh, Bhavatanha is that deep desire just to be exist bhava means exist the desire to exist and uh, yeah it does it does feel like that at some time you know it's just like i know i shouldn't want but i want to anyway <laughs> and it's just because i want to feel like i'm a, i'm there yeah and it's uh, yeah i assert my right to want <laughs> I guess they are all very closely linked and the uh, Bhava Tanha is at the kind of one of the most subtle Tanhas to be eradicated uh, before enlightenment so if we really catch Bhava Tanha then we really caught it but we see signs of it yeah <laughs> yes yeah, I mean, even though, even if we can see that wanting is suffering, we still prefer to suffer than to be nothing, you know, because it makes you feel alive, it makes you feel you exist. You know, like anger has a certain um, gratification and that's that feeling of kind of very solid, I'm here and I'm right and I know, you know, there's a very sort of solid sense of self that comes along and sometimes we rather that than the fear of just being kind of mm. nothing mm -hmm. I mean when we come to the path we kind of know that the sense of self or at least there's a little bit of an intuition that it's causing us suffering but but then we want to be the meditator 
We don't want to let go <laughs> completely. Or we want to be a non. So many people say, I want to be a non. And I'm always kind of wary when I hear that. I mean, it is just language. And I'm, I'm not saying that's like necessarily any wronger view than I have. But I do try to change the language around that because we're not becoming anything. You know, we're just renouncing, actually. We're renouncing. We're taking an ordination. We're not becoming a bikuni or a bhikkhu or you know anything actually so we can definitely establish identities around whatever we do and it's really tricky really tricky whatever we do we start to identify with it you know I am a teacher I remember when my mom used to say what do you want to be and I was like I don't want to be anything <laughs> and I used to think actually that it was really weird that people define themselves by their job it's not you're not a teacher you teach right it's something you do of course, that's not the depth of non-self by any means, but still, we do define ourselves by whatever we do. Um, I'm just going to come to Richard, because he had his hand up, and then I'm going to come to Leo in our room, who has her hand up. And I think you can even see, see them, actually, in the nice background there. Yeah, you've got your hand up. I'll come to Richard first, because he had his up. If you still got a, a question, Richard. And then we'll come to the uh, chat after that. Can you unmute? I think, yeah. Yep, done it. Um, yes, and there was, it's just like, I just had a little, I just think, I'm just wondering about, about the understanding of, um, of delusion. And I suddenly remember this text, you know, which is from the Tibetan tradition about um, Samantha Badger, you know, and there's a prayer by Samantha Badger when he talks about ignorance and the beginning of ignorance. And a part of it is, um, you know, Samantha Badger in his prayer, and he talks about, you know, he says, from the beginning, you beings are deluded because you do not recognize the awareness of the ground. Being this unmindful of what occurs is delusion. The very state of unawareness and the course of going astray. From this delusive state comes a sudden fainting away and then the subtle consciousness of wavering fear. From that wavering there arises a separation of self and the perception of others as enemies. Gradually the tendency of separation strengthens and from this the cycle of samsara begins mm -hmm. then the emotions the five poisons develop the actions of these emotions are endless you beings lack awareness because you are unmindful and this is the basis of your going astray innate unawareness means unmindfulness and distraction Imputing unawareness means dualistic thoughts towards self and others. Both kinds of unawareness are the basis of the delusion of all being. Dualistic thoughts create doubt from subtle attachment to this dualistic tone of mind. Dualistic tendencies become stronger and thicker. Food, wealth, clothes, home and friends, five objects of the senses and your beloved family. All these things cause torment by creating longing and desire. These are all worldly delusion. The activities of grasping and clinging are endless. When the fruition of attachment ripens, you know, it goes on and on and on. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> it goes endless. So the basic understanding of that is then, so the nature simply says, let your consciousness relax in its own natural state, then your um, awareness will be able to hold its own. So, you know, it's, it's not very subtle, but it's just a very traditional Tibetan... Tibetan way, yeah. Yeah. But I suddenly remembered that, mm -hmm. and I rushed around and picked it up and thought I would share it. Okay, thank you, Richard. You're welcome. 
Yeah. I mean, there are quite a few philosophical differences there, actually, with the way the Buddha teaches the Paticca Samapada. And the first one that stuck out is that actually in the Nidana Samyutta, the Buddha goes so far as to actually say somewhere in here, because I read it earlier, that it's wrong to think I am conscious or I, I anything, because he's saying there isn't one who feels. That's what it was. It's like the one who feels is a delusion. There's only feeling. Yeah, no, because in this, because in this, um, yeah, in this tradition, it's, um, you know, from Samantha Badger, he claims to be the original Buddha. But so, well, that's dodgy, isn't it? It's just a bit dodgy, you know. It is a bit dodgy. Let, yeah. yeah, let's get back to the early Buddhist understanding. Yeah. Quite a lot more in here. Um, yeah. And the other philosophical difference, really, is this idea of duality and non-duality. The Buddha's not teaching non-duality. That's not the Buddha's teaching. That's actually the Advaita Vedanta teaching. It's nothing to do with being separated from the kind of, um, you know, absolute consciousness or something like this, uh, or some kind of, you know, um, consciousness that's beyond this law of cause and effect. The Paticca Sampada, as I understand it, is something that's arising in a particular, um, I mean, not in a being, right, but each process is is independent of another. So it's not about interdependence. It's a different doctrine. And I'm not sure if it was suggesting that, but just to point that out in general, um, this is a process we can observe within a single, um, well, you can't say a being, but it's, <laughs> it's arising within, <laughs> separate from other beings. So each person has to understand it within themselves and for themselves. I mean, I'm not really explaining that well either. But anyway, I would really rather get back to um, to the early Buddhist understanding because uh, I don't think we can improve on the Buddha's words. <laughs> it's my personal feeling. <laughs> Leo, you had a question. Is that really a question or, or something? A reflection on, on what you were doing? So I think it's okay. I want to. Yeah, more. Do you want to hear more of the of the group? Okay. Uh, you want to go for this? Um, I found dependent arising really helpful on the mental level. It is clear that the sutta reads on the lifetime level. Despite that, understanding existence becoming as a mental process during meditation that leads to a mental world arising with, with a sense of self with specific clingings, craving has given me insight into my own psychology. It has helped me to loosen craving that has led to more ease in this birth. Is it inappropriate to think in this way, thoughts? Um, I don't think so. I think it is both. It they can be seen as a across multiple lifetimes and also ignorance in this uh, present moment when that ignorance is not there then you do not uh, have some create a whole create a whole world and that is subject to aging and death so, yeah, it can be seen in both ways. I think it is definitely useful to see it in both ways. Mm. Yeah, I think part of it can be observed, but not the part from delusion to consciousness, because that's already happened. But I think some of it can be observed. I mean, certainly the next moment of mind consciousness can be observed as a sort of, it's not actually a continuation, but you can sometimes see how one moment conditions the next, conditions the next. In other words, if you have like a wholesome mind state, there's a certain um, sort of free, what can you say? Like it has a certain momentum. I mean, at this stage, I think most of us probably can't see individual mind moments arising and passing. But eventually they'll start to kind of lose the comic momentum behind them and, and start to change. So maybe the joy, for example, you can feel that it has different shades, right? It'll start to build, then it'll get strong, then it'll start to subside. 
And if we could see that even more closely, then we'd see it's just moments conditioning one another. So, yeah, I mean, I think for me, I've practiced a lot with that link between um, contact, feeling and craving very much so, because that's a direct experience that we can have in this lifetime, you know. Um, and uh, it's a very powerful practice when we can actually get to that point of contact or even just to the point of feeling arising and recognize it as impermanent recognize the momentary nature of it because I think feeling is something you can see the um, characteristic of impermanence in when the mindfulness is strong and it almost disables the capacity to crave because it's changing too fast so, it, or at least it undermines the um, velocity of the reaction, let's say. Uh, so, yeah, and then the reaction, you could see it as Sankara, right? Way back in the beginning of the process. <clears throat> sankara, Pacha, Nama, Rupa. So in a way, yeah, it then creates new kind of matter. It creates like new feelings, new um, mental states again. So, yeah, I do think we can. I just think that it's important to understand this does read on a three lifetime level because otherwise it can that argument can be used to try to uh, remove the doctrine of rebirth from the suttas, which is then, you know, dubious <laughs> to say the least. You know, we're losing a lot because we don't have to believe it, but it's good to... Um, Give the Buddha some, give the Buddha's teaching some weight, and um, take it as a hypothesis to 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 try to discover for yourself, work out for yourself whether it's true or not. Don't just dismiss it outright. So um, that's the only concern I would have with um, only seeing it as this lifetime. Yeah. I think it's amazing the insights that can come from our own psychology through practicing with this and seeing how one thing conditions the next. I think without that, yeah, there's still a lot of delusion. Even, you know, if we do focus mostly on samatha and, and never really look at how things are arising in a bit more depth, it's going to be harder. It's going to take longer to, you know, break through to stream money. Even if people are sitting in jhanas for, you know, they, they can sometimes be doing that for decades and they don't break through. So I do think, you know, it's a great way to sharpen our wisdom. Yeah. Oh, there's another one. Okay. <laughs> do you want to go for it? I think it's just a recommendation. All right. Um, the simplest way I understand ignorance delusion is that it was likely an evolutionary necessity for survival. Well, yeah, by Dr. Robert Wright course called <laughs> Buddhism and Modern Psychology, which might it might help explain the idea better. Necessity, necessity for our survival. Absolutely, that's why when you remove delusion, guess what? <laughs> Cessation. We haven't gone into that. We've not even got past birth aging and death here, or even aging and death but if we would have got through the whole thing we would have then reversed it patiloma and uh yeah without delusion there is cessation of existence that's precisely the point so yes it's necessary and um yeah do we want to keep on existing <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Shall we read a little bit more? We've got 10 minutes. We could at least read through the next uh, couple of links. I think we'll probably be doing this next week too. Um, and what monastics is birth? So here we also have the, the, the three lifetime thing. The birth of the various beings into the various orders of beings. They're being born, descent, i.e. into the womb, production, the manifestation of the aggregates, the obtaining of the sense bases. This is called birth. And the sense bases basically mean um, the mind, uh, the sense of touch, sight, sound, smell, and taste. So they're the sense bases, and they come along with the body, you know, unless one of them is not working in some way, but they 
come along with the body. They can't exist without the body. And what, monastics, is existence? There are these three kinds of existence. Sense sphere existence, form sphere existence, and formless sphere existence. This is called existence. So that's Kama, Kama Bhava? No. Yeah, but is it Bhava? No, it's Kama Bhava, I suppose. And Rupa Bhava? Rupa Bhava? Bhava, I forget. Loka, yeah, but this is the existence. Probably local, anyway. And Arupa, yeah. And we're in the Kama one. We're in the sense sphere existence right now. And what, monastics, is clinging? There are these four kinds of clinging. Clinging to sensual pleasures. Clinging to views, clinging to rules and vows, and clinging to a doctrine of self. This is called clinging. Shall we keep reading a little bit? And what bhikkhus or monastics is craving? There are these six classes of craving. Craving for forms. So again, this correlates to the six senses, craving for forms, craving for sounds, craving for odors, craving for tastes, craving for tactile objects, and craving for mental phenomena. This is called craving. And what, monastics, is feeling? There are these six classes of feeling. Feeling born of eye contact, feeling born of ear contact, feeling born of nose contact, feeling born of tongue contact, feeling born of body contact, and feeling born of mind contact. This is called feeling. So they all relate to the different senses, and when those senses come in contact with uh, their objects, then um, then feeling arises and you know you can divide it into six that way in terms of um, the contact to any one of those senses but then you can also divide it into pleasant painful and neutral and even furthermore you can divide pleasure painful and neutral feelings into um, mm, sometimes they call it carnal and spiritual it really means pleasures of the senses and pleasures that are not of the senses. So actually that's different. Actually that's different. That doesn't come into Paticca Samapada. So in this case, we are talking about like the sensual pleasure, the feelings born of these six senses. Yeah. Okay, we've got another question. It'll probably have to be the last um, because this is all very deep and we're almost out of time. So I'm coming to Rekha. Yes, I think my question. Will be, I think my question will be pretty easy to answer. I'm just wondering what it means to not cling to rules and vows um, as a Buddhist. So especially as a monk or nun, I imagine you know rules and the vows are very important. But I'm wondering if it means maybe um, understanding when you might have have to be flexible yeah. uh, for example for ethical or moral reasons or yeah is this maybe referring to something else right I think that's part of it at least that's how it's practiced I think skillfully but I think the main um, uh, meaning of that is not um, to believe that by those rites and rituals or rules and vows that we can be liberated they're not enough right for liberation alone so not to be sort of clinging to them in the sense that if we do this if we do that then we'll get enlightened other people don't do that they don't do say animal sacrifice or they don't do kind of counting the rosary beads in the right, right way or they don't do vipassana they do metta <laughs> um you know this idea that um yeah uh, that that enough that that alone is enough for liberation so it's kind of misunderstanding their purpose and place in the path. And I think so, yeah, also it's kind of pre-streamlining because 
until you are uh, a stream winner, you still have to, to some extent, um, try to observe these things, like you're training yourself. But then uh, once you're a stream winner, the basic ethical precepts are so deeply ingrained that it's not possible to do um, serious harm by body, speech or mind. I mean, you can still do some harm, but you would basically, um, you wouldn't be able to keep it hidden. You'd be completely transparent and acknowledge your faults very quickly and uh, amend your ways very, very quickly. So can I can I ask about a specific example that I've been wondering about? Yes, if it's, <laughs> it, it shouldn't be too long, but it's, it's you know one of the things that often comes to mind is, for example, with uh, something like you know uh, taking uh, the um, the vow not to lie. Um, I can imagine situations, for example, where I might put someone in danger by, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah. not lying, let's say. So yeah. would not clinging to that vow in that situation, w would that make sense or? I don't think it's, uh, I think it's two different things. That's not included. I mean, not clinging to vows isn't an excuse to break our seal. It isn't saying that, you know, we shouldn't cling, therefore we should adapt. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that clinging to vows and adherences has been overcome in a stream winner because they understand that that alone can't lead to liberation so but what you're talking about is more an application of ethics how ethics applies to the world right. separate from this rule you, you know we can't use this rule to justify any of that or to sort of make um allowances because that becomes very gray area but certainly the actual practice of ethical behavior and virtue in the world is never black or white and sometimes we have to um, take the course of action that we believe will be least harmful. You know, for example, if you're hiding people from an assassin and right. someone comes to the house and says, do you have these people here? We're going to kill them. Then you, you might say, no, they're not here, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to make that decision for yourself and there'll be a bit of bad karma, but it might have been all who knows, right? You have to make that decision for yourself and be responsible for that. So it wouldn't, I don't think, prevent you from being enlightened. Um, it's just that our sila, our virtue, has to be more and more refined as time goes by. And it's nuanced, you know, it's not like a set of rules that you can just apply, bang, to every situation. And uh, we have to apply our wisdom to it. Yeah. That's really, really important. And you see when people come into monastic life in the beginning, they're a lot more literal in their interpretation of the rules. And, you know, they can even start to feel a little bit holier than thou because they're sort of observing everything perfectly and folding their cloth in the right way and bowing with exactly the right amount of fingers on the floor kind of thing. And, you know, feeling a little bit um, proud about that. Um, and then as you continue, the you start to trust yourself more you start to trust your kind of ethical grasp of the of virtue much more and you know which bits you can relax because they're not actually ethically wrong and which bits you still need to refine so i don't know if that makes some sense <laughs> so there's another couple of questions which i don't i really like to finish every question so please don't send me another one <laughs> <laughs> because I think these can be done pretty quickly. Didn't the Buddha say the rules for monastics can be changed by the Sangha if needed? So there's a difference there between the rules that are ethical and the rules that are conventions that developed from the situation at the time. And I think he was probably talking about the conventional ones, but because um, Venerable Ananda didn't ask him to specify, people don't feel they want to change it because then we lose um, the teachings of the Buddha that have been preserved over so many uh, thousands of years so but in reality when you live together with a group of monastics it's not that I don't consider these rules I consider them training guidelines or um, processes of um, acknowledgement and um, what do you call it when somebody's not repatriated re mm, like bringing them back in again, bringing them back on track again. There's no punishment there. So the way we observe the Vinaya is that the Buddha doesn't say, if you do this, this is terrible. He says, eating after eating at the wrong time is an offense to be confessed. That's very different. So if you eat after a certain time and then you confess it, you're practicing in, a, in accord with the Vinaya. That's how I see it. 
you yourself know when it's you know it's getting too much or it's going off track and the people in the community will tell you as well but um it's a very forgiving kind of system of training it's not a a, a set of laws to my understanding did the venerable person say that monastic rules couldn't be changed i think he said after buddha's pony banner to avoid them changing the rules not sure about that it's possible it's possible because he was more on the ascetic on the ascetic side. I don't know. Do you know that? If the Venerable Kasapa said that monastic rules couldn't be changed. I haven't heard that. But people nowadays say that. <laughs> like let's say they can't be lifted out, they can't be taken out from the text. But I think that's different from then working mm -hmm. around working with them, let's say, um, and acknowledging that, well, it does say, for example, um, don't pick a flower, but today I picked a flower and I, I did deviate from that. It's different from saying, well, I think that was stupid. Let me actually take it out of the text. That would be dangerous because then we wouldn't know what was really coming from the Buddha and what wasn't. But it's helpful to learn the background stories as well a little bit, although they might be a bit mythical, mythological. Um, but there's usually a reason they have a reason embedded in them how these things came about and it's the reasons and the principles behind it that I think are more um, helpful than just telling everybody you're doing it wrong you're doing it wrong you know and just not really knowing why you're doing what you are so anyway there's a lot here isn't there I think you should all come to the monastery and we can see how long we can talk about this for because we might just talk about the sitters all night you know, those three monks that Ajahn Brahm and also I like to talk about a lot as the model of monastic harmony, who lived mostly in silence, but then every fifth night they would talk about the Dhamma for the whole night. <laughs> so imagine, they would have had a lot to share. So when they meditated, they meditated, they did it, they went 100% all out. And then when they talked, they also went 100% all out. But um, we're trying to do this moderately here. So we should probably wind up. And uh, usually Manoi has a couple of words to say at the end anyway. Um, so that'll have to be pretty brief. And I actually think she, oh, she's still there. Yeah. Okay. I'm still there. Very brief. There's um, when, when Venerable Chanda goes for her um, Vasa, um, we will have programs. So I'll put a link there. So please check the link. And there's there's talks on Sundays and there are different times. So please uh, check them. There won't be any sutta discussion. So Saturday, uh, Saturday uh, metta, but you know, it will be okay. there until she goes on for the, it, you know, <laughs> for the Vasa. Not yet, not yet. Yeah, and yeah, it will be there in July. So I just put the <laughs> events. And um, so thank you very much for coming and thank you very much Barbas, for all these very wonderful teachings and the discussions and able for us to question and learn from each other as well. And thank you very much for both of you. And um, as I normally tell every day, um, um, Please, uh, if you can, we would be very grateful if you could support Anukampa Bhikkhuni project to make all these teachings happening in the future and um, and maybe more Bhikkhunis for next generations as well. So um, please help the Anukampa Bhikkhuni project go on by donating. Um, and uh, I, I didn't do the link because it's too late. But it is Anukampa Bikuni Project, anukampaprojects.org slash donate. If you go to our website, you'll find it. Thank you very much. Ah, you're muted, Venerable. 
Oh, I'm muted. That's why everyone has their hand up, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought other people wanted to speak. I was just saying that um, there's no meta session tomorrow, but I think there's a meta meditation next Saturday. And there'll be a meta chanting on Wednesday and a sutta class next Friday. So just to say there are still quite a few sutta classes before I leave. Don't think about that yet. My goodness, I've got so much to do. I can't even imagine. It's another lifetime away. So, <laughs> but Manoa is getting excited because actually when I'm away, you'll have lots of bikinis to teach you, which is great. Um, hopefully once a week, like most weeks on a Sunday. So that will be happening soon. And uh, anything else? There might still be some places on my retreat in Gaia House, but it's co-taught with another lay teacher. I don't know if that appeals to anyone, but anyway, that's happening as well in July. And uh, we'll see you soon. I'm sure there's lots I'm forgetting, but uh, we'll see you soon. And for next year, you can also apply to come and stay. (laughs) Okay, lovely to see you all. Hope you enjoyed that and uh, hope to see you next time. Please feel welcome. Bye, everyone. We can unmute you, maybe.